Dr. Elizabeth Howells is the Director of Composition at Atlantic Armstrong State University. In addition, her work as a site director with the National Writing Project has provided her with many opportunities to work with teachers and students at diverse levels. Her teaching interests include writing, rhetoric, gender and women's studies, composition studies, and 19th century British literature. She has published a wide variety of articles, both scholarly and pedagogical, on a range of subjects, literary and rhetorical. This presentation unites her te teaching and research interests. Beth, are you ready to get started? Yes. Okay, I'll turn it over to you then. Sounds good. Um, hello to everyone, and, and thank you for uh, tuning in uh, today. Let me just make sure I've got the screen set up. Um, Uh, the, the talk I'm going to give today, the talk I'm going to um, present today is, is kind of derived from some um, issues I've been facing in my particular uh, academic context here at Armstrong. Um, Armstrong is a school of about 7,500. It's located in lovely Savannah, Georgia. Um, and it's a school within the University System of Georgia. And, um, we don't have a graduate program. Uh, I'm the WPA here. We run about 65 sections of comp per term. Um, I mean, uh, excuse me, per year, per term. And um, one of the issues I've been facing in going to observe classes and thinking about our uh, teaching our comp classes um, strategically and consistently and um, in smart ways is this issue with our comp two course, which is our composition and literature course. And, and um, so the ways in which uh, the, uh, the composition sometimes gets overlooked, um, you know, we've got a number of instructors who are teaching 4-4 loads. We've got a number of instructors who are coming from a current traditional context. We have a number of instructors who have writing um, degrees, MFAs, or, or literature degrees and master's degrees. Um, and, and we're up to about 60% part-time instructors. So given these and kind of the many complications this context presents, I've, I've been trying to think about, you know, what we're doing in our Comp 2 classes and how we're making sure that we're treating um, both the, the teaching of writing and the teaching of literature um, respectfully. And um, so this is, the, this is the situation and some of the problems I've had, and, and here are some of the ways I'm trying to noodle through some of the solutions, and I hope that this um, conversation that I'll initiate with my initial comments will lead to maybe some brainstorming um, and some of your ideas of some successful situations um, that you've encountered. Um, so I'm going to start the presentation, the formal presentation at this point. It's entitled Beyond Bob Dylan, Composition and Literature in the Classroom. Hang on one second, I'm making sure. There we go. We've all seen the movies. The successful teacher of literature is the one that connects the literature to students' real lives, whether it is Robin Williams and Dead Poets Society teaching his students to engage in barbaric yachts, a la Whitman, or Michelle Pfeiffer in Dangerous Minds, and almost any other teacher, really, in any TV movie who uses Bob Dylan to demonstrate contemporary connections to poetry, reconciling the conflicting co cultures of music and poetry, the real world and the academy, the creative and the canon. The students recognize music, something they like, as not so far afield from poetry, something they fear. The students in these films also come to see themselves as poets and bards in empowering ways, trumpeting injustice, no longer outsiders to the system, but improvers of the system. Thus, in fact, these movies may reflect real-world desires, albeit somewhat re reductively. As teachers who practice engaged pedagogy, we do desire demonstrating the nature and value of literature to students so that poetry resonates and literature empowers. However, the path to this end goal is never as simple as a, a five-minute soundtrack montage. In his essay, Taking Notes, Taking English Notes on Teaching Introductory Literature Classes, John Trimber describes why this work of making literature relevant is necessary. Um, here's a, a quote from him. Many of my students are voracious readers, but much of the reading they do, science fiction, thrillers, cyberpunk, bestsellers, romances, is disqualified ahead of time in their own and their English teachers' minds from the domain of English. Moreover, a surprising number of my students not only consume such popular genres, they also produce them, both alone and collaboratively, through self-sponsored writing. 
My point here is that English, at least as it is pr presently constituted, makes little effort to recognize where or how its own particular concerns intersect with students' experience as readers and their productive work as writers. Instead, if intro to lit anthologies are any indication, English simply begins with the assumption that students should study the genres fiction, poetry, drama. He suggests that one way to confront, uh, Trimber suggests that one way to confront uh, this distance is to begin with asking the questions, what is literature and why require literature? In order to foreground the contradictory and conflicting nature of the subject, field, and course in productive ways. Thus, he establishes the end goal of engaging students to be empowered by literature and feel ownership of it at the outset of the course. In fact, our composition courses, or Comp 1 courses, regularly uh, do practice these techniques that empower students to become engaged through initiating efforts to enable them to find their individual voices, to locate themselves within the academy, to understand their individual responsibility as local and global citizens, and to re reflect on and revise their positions in prose rhetorically. In contrast, however, over recent years in composition courses about literature, I still find myself observing classes and reading evaluations in which students feel disenfranchised from the writing they are doing about literature and experience the disconnection between the class discussions about literature that can be really invigorating and the at-home graded work of writing they are doing. In terms of scheduling, I often find teachers clamoring to teach the Comp 2 composition and literature course, preferring it to the Comp 1 composition and rhetoric course. However, my experience in many classrooms and many student comments on courses often point to a current traditional form of pedagogy in which, like one student commented, teacher and students alike are not sure how class time relates to the papers we have to write. In their excellent collection, When Writing Teachers Teach Literature, Bringing Writing to Reading, Art Young and Toby Fulwiler summarize the quandary in this way. Today, many college teachers of English find themselves trained as scholars to study literary texts, but trained as writing teachers to study how students learn. Preparation for teaching literature is commonly focused on lecture demonstrations and Socratic discussion of canonical texts, while not attending in any deliberate way to the conditions, needs, and abilities of the learners trying to read those texts. The focus is on the text, not the learner. Here's the text. Read it. Learn about it. Tell back what you learned. If you disagree with the instructor's interpretation, be prepared to defend your interpretation with specific evidence from the text. So unwittingly, we reproduce our own educational experiences, good and bad, on our students, much like we might on our children, in fact. Sometimes the connection is just a matter of transparency. At the end of class time, an articulated link needs to be made that outright states that the work of class discussion is the talk that will be translated into writing, is pre-writing, is modeling writing. Brophy's notion and collaboration in the conversation of mankind merely needs to be put on the table, as it were. Of course, this experience could be a personal issue of mine or product of a limited number of schools like mine that still teach composition and literature as a single course. However, many regional and universities and colleges like mine are nowhere near the creating of composition as separate from literature for a range of philosophical and economical reasons, economic reasons. Post-process isn't a given, and a conflict between composition and literature isn't really an option at an institution like mine. In fact, the textbook market for Comfort Lit Books is ever expanding to meet the continued needs of courses that teach composition as a continuation of comp Composition 101 that must teach writing, introduce students to literature, and incorporate research. Furthermore, the critical discussion has continued after Maxine Hairston validated writing as its own subject for composition classes in her 85, Breaking Our Bonds and Reaffirming Our Connections. And Erica Lindemann concurred almost 10 years later in her 1993, Freshman Composition, No Place for Literature in College English. Almost 10 years ago, in 2002, Peter Elbow opined on the cultures of literature and composition, why could each, what could each learn from each other? in which he implicitly offers an argument for maintaining the marriage by reconciling the values of each discipline. And when Shirley Wilson Logan addressed the addresses the question, why college English, in her 2006 commentary in the journal, her response is as follows. Ultimately, what students remember about our courses, if they remember anything, is not author X or text Y, but how to understand and generate discourse. Clearly, this response necessitates a reconciliation of composition with literature. Here's Elbow's recommendation for what literature and composition can learn from each other. I wish the culture of composition would learn to give an equally central place to the imaginative and metaphorical dimensions of language. And I don't want my emphasis on stories and poems to obscure my larger emphasis on all language, even if the only goal is teaching essays. 
Surely many of the best and most effective essays don't just make good use of metaphors and images, rather they grow out of imaginative metaphorical thinking, out of the imagination itself. But we want to understand the craft of such essays unless we feel their roots in the imagination, rather than only in clear logical thinking and language. I wish the culture of literature would learn more about inherent, learn more inherent attention and concern for students, their lives, and what's on their minds. If it did, I think teachers of literature would give more attention to helping students read with involvement and write imaginative pieces. Even if our only goal is to get students to understand a work of literature, nothing works better than inviting students to write stories or poems that are structured thema structurally, thematically, or rhetorically related to it. While this discussion today won't meditate extensively on the theoretical value of maintaining the marriage, it is concerned with the pedagogical practicality of housing these bedfellows. What does it mean to teach literature with its expectations and objectives, including attending to style, exploring genre, and introducing literature, along with maintaining the integrity of the values of composition pedagogy with its reference, reverence for student voice, reflection, and creative writing? It is my hope that this discussion will move beyond the commonplace that Bob Dylan is signifier to the common ground of composition is doing the work of literature. Furthermore, I hope my initial comments here can inspire discussion of other solutions in workable ways to make sure that the work of such courses is done responsibly and inspiringly. I hope I can we can dialogue about some of your successes and ideas after my initial comments here. Um, so not unlike a, a, a WAC um, discussion that many of us have participated in, this next section of the presentation We'll examine uh, possibilities for informal writing or writing to learn, as well as formal writing or writing to communicate, to use our Young's terminology. Um, so I'm going to start with um, some ideas about this, this writing to learn. Um, one of the first ways writing can be incorporated into the literature classroom is, of course, through informal writing. These documents may be graded, ungraded, or minimally graded, and are means to require students' reflection on their understanding, to allow for writing before speaking, to make students accountable in less performative ways than in a class discussion or a formal paper, and to make active cognitive work. Such exercises may be as simple as asking students to write about what they read the night before, to jot down questions they have, or to record what they learned during a class session. Such documents may be submitted to the instructor, exchanged with other students, used to initiate discussion, or kept for a journal, folder, or portfolio. Here I want to outline different possibilities for engaging in informal writing designed to make meaning and to operate as a means of learning and a tangible artifact of the learning process rather than a product to be evaluated formally. I want to start with um, Peter Elbow's idea about, well, Peter Elbow's revised idea about pre-reading um, and the way he's discussed that opportunity for pre-reading questions in a number of venues in eloquent ways over the years. He describes pre-reading questions as essential for ensuring students are engaging in aesthetic reading experiences, to use Rosenblatt's terminology. He's explained them as a means of opening a door into a text or priming the pump for discussion of a text. For example, when students are being initiated into a work that they fear or are unfamiliar with, they might be asked a question in the days or weeks prior to encountering it that gives them a means of entry into the text. We're in reading The Tempest, as Elbow has suggested, he asked students about a time when they held a grudge. Prior to reading Othello, I've asked, um, I've asked my students if they were ever jealous, and if so, when. Um, in my textbook, Literature Reading to Write, in fact, I offer pre-reading questions before each text so students have access, that means of access to the work that follow. Pre-reading prompts serve as a means for priming students for their reading. Again, writing is not just a means of evaluation, but a way for students to discover what they think. These questions get students in the mindset of a main idea, a particular theme in a story, and students can be charged with jotting these down these reflections as part of reading homework or at the end of a class period. Students might write a minute paper reflecting on the work done that day and then the pre-reading question for the next day's reading assignment. In this way, students might be directed toward a main idea for the class discussion of the work. Furthermore, such prompts might be revised by the instructor to direct students to the theme of a particular course or the direction of a particular conversation. Um, next, I want to talk about reading responses, reading journals, um, or uh, uh, focused free writes. Um, and, and these are a second strategy for incorporating a means of writing for student writing for writing to learn for students. Um, some instructors are devoted to reading journals, and I've seen them used in, in really smart ways in which students respond to prompts, passages, or personal inspiration in conjunction with the text in order to account for their reading in some way. They may take the form of reflections, double entry notebooks, or, or mini essays of some sort. These journals are submitted daily, weekly, monthly, or as part of a portfolio of some sort. 
the instructor responds for a percentage of the grade. Um, personally, these have not worked for me, and I know um, many of you can, can tell me what I did wrong, but um, personally, after suffering through many a stale reading journal that read like busy work um, that students were suffering through and felt like busy work to me to respond to, I've become more devoted to the minute paper, the focus free write. Here students come to class and begin the session by writing. This, in fact, sets the tone for the class, and particularly at an institution like mine that has a large number of um, uh, 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 students who are um, commuting. Um, you know, they come from parking the car and busy lives and not campus and working and things, and they need this kind of transition period. So they write for tw 10 to 12 minutes in response to a prompt of my choosing. Um, as I tell them on the syllabus, these in-class reading responses will sometimes be a written response to a particular passage, theme, character, or image, and sometimes they'll be more creative or experimental. And this particular method allows for students to transition from their complicated worlds without to the world within our classroom. It gives them incentive and space to recall and re-engage with their reading. It provides a means for them to be accountable for their reading. Furthermore, these quick writes provide a jumping off point for our discussion. As Tracy Santa asserts in her brief writing with students commentary, it, quote, it is exploratory writing, an attempt to explain to ourselves what we know in anticipation of having to explain or our, argue our position to others. Um, ultimately, these texts have potential as pre-writing documents as students develop their formal writing projects. As an instructor, I evaluate these quickly and holistically with a few narrative comments, plus, and, plus or minuses, or a one to five point system. Sometimes I might just have them share them orally or share them with each other. Early on, these are difficult for students, but quick improvement is always seen as students become more fluent by writing every day. Um, and, and so these are the ways that I address the, the reading response issue. Um, a form of reading response or focused free write I've, I've liked is um, writing off a line or, or this form of close reading, where I ask students to identify a passage line or word that's significant in the text and to, to mark, indicate what that is at the top of their page. Underneath, they are charged with discussing this line and the reason they selected it as significant. I think this work is useful for their investment in our discussion there, determining these passages that we're discussing, these lines, these images. Um, and further, this work models the kind of work they must do in their own paper when they're integrating quotations. Here's the quote, and now I'm discussing it. Um, the next point on meaning making. I also like to require students to make meaning of a text to use Bertolt's terminology, I simply ask them what a text means, and then they must support their claim with specific references to moments from the text. Again, I'm just making um, transparent, making tangible the work that they will do in their own writing. It launches our discussion, and it models the analyses they must craft into formal projects. Um, Pre-writing and writing process of reflections, peer group, workshopping. Of course, writing to learn also takes place in a literature classroom much like it might in a composition classroom, with pre-writing activities in which students must stop at the end of a class session, reflect on a potential paper topic. These minute papers give them something tangible to lay the fear of a blank page and something material to bring to a discussion with a peer group, a writing center, or their instructor. I often find just them getting something on the page, you know, or I, I would like to believe might get in the way from of potential plagiarism. If they've got this idea already, they might not be surfing the web to find one. Um, further, students are charged with reflecting on successes and failures with their individual writing process at strategic moments, perhaps on the back of their final draft or as part of their final draft submission. Again, as instructors, we set the tone for process-oriented pedagogy and must inspire their reflections on writing about literature. Furthermore, students might write to learn as part of their work in peer groups or workshopping to produce a record of their learning in an informal way that could be presented to the class orally, returned to fellow students for feedback, collected for a portfolio, or, or submitted to the instructor for evaluation. Um, visual rhetoric, technological literacy, and multiple literacies. Many instructors are capitalizing on the extensive research available about multiple literacies and ask students to represent their learning visually in alternative ways through maps or visual representations. Students can be asked to recreate a setting visually or a plot geographically. Furthermore, students are both accountable to others and sometimes more comfortable in the anonymity of virtual discussions and can account for their reading or register their learning in Blackboard discussions blogs, wikis, or alternative formats. These means bring together writing to learn and writing to communicate in exciting ways. I mean, I've seen a lot of different examples of this um, using the visual in terms of collaging or um, 
uh, having students do posters or just any, any sorts of these translations to the to the to the visual um, about what they're reading. A quick note on evaluating formal writing um, discussions with instructors, all, of course. Particularly because, um, we, you know, while we have an orientation here, we don't have graduate students. We don't have obviously teaching classes. Many of these instructors come with a lot of experience about teaching, and and are hesitant, of course, with these terrible teaching loads and um, the the need to teach at multiple institutions. Are are really hesitant about uh, assigning more writing, and and rightfully so. Um, and they express frustrations there. Um, sometimes I suggest that the solution is, you know, we'll don't evaluate all of it. Um, of course, I'm being a little cheeky there, but when pressed, I do suggest that they quit evalu evaluating all of it. Um, I, I believe, truthfully, a class culture can be established wherein students come to understand, respect, and maybe even enjoy writing to think. I'd like to believe that. It gives them a chance to really understand where they're coming from, what they are learning, and communicate it in the most clear uh, way they can, they can in words they understand. With that said, I find that, use, that I use pre-reading responses and exercises as part of classwork, group work, or text students might draw from when I initiate a class discussion. In other words, they're writing from themselves, learning that writing can be a tool for learning. I find that I respond to the focused free writes on a daily basis, evaluating them with quick, holistic evaluation and shorthand notes. These texts become documents that students bring in hand to conferences to follow up on, locations where I develop a dialogue with individual students on potential paper ideas and places for them to write down what they might then share out in class. I think it is a lot easier to respond to the question, what did you write about the story? What did you put down? As opposed to what do you think? Um, the discussion might warm up more quickly. These informal writing documents might also be a starting point for group work in class. Sometimes I walk around as students write and point out words or ideas I like as they are writing them. I'm not sitting at my desk idly while they do busy work, so they realize if I'm invested, they should be too, even if I'm not quote unquote grading what they're writing. Well, initially, students, some students certainly balk at this co um, college cultural shift emphasizing individual responsibility rather than exterior surveillance. They learn and they grow. Soon enough, though, they quit asking if this is for a grade. Again, a culture is developed wherein everyone is participating in writing. Some instructors also have good experiences using such responses for participation grades um, or a notebook to submit at certain points. As with most pedagogies, each instructor must customize methods based on his or her style. Um, I, I want to switch gears now and talk about this writing to communicate. Um, of course, literature courses require students to write in order to represent their learning and communicate their understanding to their instructors. However, formal writing can take different forms beyond the explication, the analysis, or the research paper. And those students represent their understanding of the academic discourse, usually to the instructor. The instructor responds to the paper in terms of form and content, and the paper's life ends. However, the literature classroom might reconsider the requirements of the formal project as well as the feedback loop of such projects. And here are some possibilities for writing to um, communicate beyond that explica explication summary analysis argument. Um, the first one I want to put out there is um, an immersion project. And, and of course, immersion projects seem kind of trendy right now. Um, and there have been uh, a spate of them to come out in nonfiction over recent years, from Iron Reich's Nickel and Dime to King Solver's Animal, Animal Vegetable Mural to Mineral to Julie Powell's Julie and Julia and to the Year of Living Biblically. Um, and I've seen this um, immersion project used in composition classrooms in really smart ways. But I wonder about translating these and transitioning these to the literature classroom. Students might be challenged to capitalize on the model of their classwork with literature, where they discover literature every day in class. Together, perhaps they could use various blog platforms to chronicle a literature immersion project in which they argue for the value of a work not discussed in class, but perhaps part of the textbook or poets.org or a reputable website in order to engage in a poem a day or a text a day exploration, maybe for a month. Students might address the meaning and value of the work both personally and literarily. These postings might be as prescribed as the teacher would desire with certain prompts to respond to or criteria to use. Um, platforms like WordPress, Blogspot, Posters are quite user friendly. Um, reading journals then become public in this way and students are challenged to discover literature on their own in writing for an audience with all the, the, the value that comes with writing for a, a clear audience. Um, a, a second possibility is um, the, the commonplace book. Um, either virtually or textually, students could also develop a literary commonplace book using the Renaissance model as poets.org suggests here. 
Um, here students make a record of quotations and passages that move them and perhaps reflect on why. Here are the instructions that the website suggests. Today, find a small notebook to record poems or fragments of poems that you come across in your reading. As you add to your own commonplace book, you'll be drawing a map of your life as a reader and thinker, creating a valuable portrait of your memory and time. Again, um, the instructor can be as directive as he or she wants with the prompts, I think. Students can use multiple modalities to craft this artifact, either textually or, I think, virtually. And classmates can be encouraged to participate in responding to these in some way, with post-it notes on sharing days in the class with actual notebooks, or with comments on a blog um, platform. And when I've done similar comments, I, I really see students taking ownership of these and, and being creative in ways that I haven't even, ha hadn't even considered or required. In uh, textual terror, textual power, teaching literature through writing literature, Lynn Bloom presents the following question. Why not encourage students to write creative texts in the genres and modes of the work they're studying in response to and as a way of understanding these works? According to her, the lessons learned include an understanding of, one, the innumerable versions in which a particular experience can be rendered, two, the relation of style to substance, style to self, three, the significance of emphasis, de-emphasis, omissions, gaps, erasures, four, the difficulties ethical and aesthetic of dishonesty. Five, the importance of each word, each syntactic structure, each punctuation mark in every text. Six, the critical rigor that undergirds writing well for an external audience. Seven, the necessity, aesthetic, and personal of rewriting. Eight, the importance of reading literature as well as writing it with an understanding of the writer's craft, the writer's art. Um, based on this, students might read Nuns Fret Not and write a sonnet and reflect on their experience of writing in closed forms as compared to Wordsworth. Again, students come to understand style best in this way, which, as we know, is much more challenging to discuss in a classroom than character, theme, plot, or setting. Um, through these efforts, um, attempting their own efforts at crafting style. And related to this is what um, is what Elbow um, has called Springboard Pro Projects, and Bloom calls bouncing off. And um, uh, and and th and this these have distinct possibilities. And and these are things I think we do sometimes in our classes, and 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 maybe haven't um, you know it's just kind of a flash of inspiration and haven't thought about um, consistently. Um, here, students are challenged to write creatively by revisioning certain texts. These experimental texts would necessarily be text-based and might incorporate reflection on the analytical work they did to synthesize their understanding of the text and process that synthesis creatively. So I think that reflection might be key. But some ideas here, um, retelling a narrative from an alternative point of view, like right in the voice of a character, like Toby, you know, what was he thinking in Arose for Emily when the smell arose? Um, describe what X character would do in Y situation. You know, what if, if Paul from Cather's Paul case was accused of plagiarism? How would he react to this? Um, re uh, retell this story, poem, play in a modern setting. My Last Duchess contemporarily, a scene from Othello contemporarily. Um, the instructor could then share other revisions like Dover Beach and Dover Bitch and, by Anthony Heck and, 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 and there are loads of others. Um, uh, write a prequel to the text. What was Joy Helga like before she met her match in Good Country People? Um, you know, how did, or before she got her philosophy degree? Um, write a sequel to a text. What happens to the misfit after the events of a good man is hard to find? Um, work with epistles or other literary forms. Um, Donna Rice assigns her students to write a letter of unsought advice to old school friend in, uh, to old school friend J. Alfred Prufrock, or a letter from John after the events in the yellow wallpaper, or an entry in a secret diary of the, a very old man with enormous wings, or a dialogue with Thoreau about living today according to conscience, or an email to Emerson. And so maybe playing with genre there and, and, and having students engage with different genres might be a possibility. Um, Closely related to this is, of course, the classical um, rhetorical example of, of teaching writing, um, or the example in classical rhetoric of imitation. And in fact, while imitation is a form of plat flattery, it also has potential pedagogically. Roman writing instruction still applies today, I think. And when learning to write, students benefit from learning the rules, imitating the models, and practicing through exercises. And one of the best ways to learn style is through imitating closely the long, complex sentences of Faulkner, as well as the short, compact, journalistic lines of Hemingway. In imitating syntax and diction, students of, of writing learn to read closely and write carefully with an intense and increased awareness of writerly strategy and choice. Elbow has discussed having students recast Shakespeare's Sonnet 73 with another seasonal subject, or has suggested having students rewrite Blake's Tiger with another animal burning bright. 
Um, and the idea here, of course, is that through digging into style in this way, um, students become better students of style. Performing a text. Many of us capitalize on the dramatic reality of plays in our classroom through incorporating video productions or simply reading aloud. But there are exciting possibilities for reader's theater in which students are charged with transforming a text into a work to be performed. Students must interpret a work in order to imagine it dramatically and make choices about how the information is conveyed, whether it's dialogue or stage directions. Reader's theater forces students to rethink that na the nature of literature. And here's how Schuster describes it in his article, Teaching Literature Through Performance, and cites Richard Poirier. When literature is read rhetorically in terms of performance, it ceases to function as an artifact of high culture that conveys semi-eternal truths. Instead, it offers itself as a text that embodies a struggle with words and not a putting forth of something pre-digested in the mind. And it assumes that the most worthy acts of writing and reading are signs of vibrant creative life. Um, rather than having students act out dramas to enhance them, why not have them create performances of Zora Neale Hurston's How It Feels to Be Colored Me, or Flannery O'Connor's Revelation, or Richard Seltzer's The Corpse, or Audre Lorde's The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House. For that, perhaps this is a way to literally bring a text to life. And I think in this way, doing this kind of writing work um, demonstrates the work that these authors in literature, these canonical authors in literature, have engaged in. And also um, shows students the kind of work they need to be thinking of in any of their formal writing, whether it be an analysis or in an argument, that they need to think of themselves as stylists, or they can think of themselves as stylists. Um, writing an anthology. Uh, Trimmer suggests that the big brick anthologies have a kind of distancing effect that kills literature for students. And we wrote the book on that, Trimmer. Um, Schirmer posits, in the writing classroom, teachers coach students to create their own texts. In the literature classroom, teachers judge students by their commentary on other texts. In this course, I'll invite students to create, arrange, and interpret their own textbook and see what happens. He describes having students read, select, situate, and commentate on texts as the work of the class. Thus, they come to understand um, and own literature in active ways. Um, a literary family tree. Um, I once had a student who commented after taking um, a cl this class with, with me that she likes to read funny things, and li the literature we, re we read is almost never funny. And, and actually, she was right. Um, therefore, as I was working on my textbook, I got to thinking about those genres that students already like and already felt like they had expertise in, and tried to give them a way to take ownership of and feel empowered by a, a kind of emerging genre that might not always be canonically represented. In this way, I organized part three of my book around um, genre students know and like, and the chapters then suggest um, to them, excuse me, and the chapters then suggest to them the literary counterparts that might be of interest. The genres here are comedies, music, graphic novels, horror stories, and experimental literature. And I approach these units in many chapters that allow for a change of pace before a break, or structure for group projects or presentations, or a breath of fresh air at the end of the term. The chapters are organized to introduce this new genre by someone who knows, to remind students of an example of the genre they might know, to suggest to them some text they might like to know, and then to let them know where they came from, with a suggestion of the origin of the genre in a literary family tree, so it's, it's kind of canonical roots. The tasks at the end of the chapter are not conventional writing assignments, um, but have value as group work, daily work, or perhaps an alternative research project. Um, these uh, compact chapters can certainly be expanded with further examples from students or faculty. Again, they're a starting point for dialogue, but also recognize that with responsibilities for coverage, we might have little time for such fun stuff. Students may thus be encouraged to make connections between the reading work that excites them personally and the work that is assigned to them and defined as literary. So each of these assignments here asks students to research one of the new genres in some way, um, so to research comedy and literature, and then also um, to produce something creative in the vein of one of these genres. And, and here's an example from the, the comedy chapter. Um, and here is an example from the experimental literature chapter, where students may either be assigned one of, you know, one of these projects, or the creative one, or the, the research-based one. And it's a different approach to, to both of those. Um, 
the last example of writing com communicator formal writing project is simply a variation of the research project that is often assigned in such a class. Students might be asked to approach a text from a kind of new historical perspective by, for example, looking at contemporary significance of Frankenstein then and now, or exploring a thematic question in a dated work from a contemporary perspective. Certain many of you reimagine the research project in smart ways, especially with the, the, the you know, specter of, of plagiarism out there as we really try to think of new and smart ways to make students engaged with and um, creative with and innovative with um, their research projects. And I, I would definitely love to hear some ideas there. So in conclusion, um, of course, there's still the issue of course objectives and acclimating students to academic discourse. However, a balanced approach to a pedagogy might allow for a range of tasks and exercises. If our objective is to teach students to read well, to value literature, and to write with a keen attention to audience, with an awareness of rhetoric and the audience's expectations in terms of form and style, perhaps there are multiple methodologies available to accomplish those goals. We can perhaps do a better job of the latter by reconsidering how we do the former. And perhaps we might not recast all of our formal writing assignments, but rethink our approach to lesson planning. But what if we sometimes, not always, but sometimes look to planning a class as what Elba calls an experience rather than a lecture, a workshop rather than a discussion, where writing work is not so far afield from playing with literature. And they may get a little, a bit less, to return to Bob Dylan, tangled up in blue, and a bit more towards their own themes for English B. Uh, thank you for, for participating. I think we have time for a few few questions, um, if anyone has any, or suggestions, um, and, and I would appreciate hearing those. Beth, we do uh, have a question that uh, comes from Juanita Alexander, and she's wondering if you have some suggestions along these lines um, for uh, researched assignments. Mm. Yeah, this is something that... Um, this is something that I, I really do wrestle with, and I have, um, I've tried um, different kinds of things. I mean, I've found leaving it pretty open is pretty dangerous in, in my experience because of plagiarism and because students just have trouble with direction. And one of the things that I tried to do um, most recently was make it pretty local. Flannery O'Connor was born here in Savannah, and one of the things I tried to do was um, involve our special collections that had some examples of Flannery O'Connor. Um, to go organize a field trip to go to Flannery O'Connor's birthplace in downtown Savannah um, and to obviously customize the, um, the library orientation with a librarian who um, you know, was focused on Flannery O'Connor. And this did a couple of things. Um, I, I focused it on three or four stories and students could pick um, any of those to work with. And therefore, um, one of the things that happened is I became really familiar with um, the, the, the literature about those texts, as did the students. And the students could also be then organized in research groups to share their ideas um, and their texts with each other. Um, and, and so making it local and therefore personal in that way, um, I, I think, was, was useful. Um, I've also uh, seen other instructors who have, have, have again, tried to focus the assignments a bit um, so that students are, are, are given a kind of personal investment, you know, whether it is, um, I, I know one instructor who organized his research projects around fences and had students do research into baseball, historical research, or research into racism, or research into, um, you know, depending on what their major was or what their interests were you know research into those particular areas to try to again make it somehow personal um, to to develop some sort of um, connection. Um, I've also um, tried uh, to in the in the last example I'll give the I've also tried to um, do something where I have students expand a prior project that was an analysis of a text and kind of ex explode it, it and expand it by incorporating research. And again, so they've already come to this um, text, or have already come to their research with an invested, with an investment and with ideas, and they could then um, do more focused research in that way. Um, and so those are some of the ideas that I have, but that's another area if people have got suggestions, I'd love to hear them. 
Well, that's a, um, those are great suggestions, as are uh, so many of the things in here. And I, I'm happy to say that um, there will be, these sessions will be archived, so all of, um, all Beth's great um, suggestions. Um, we've had a lot of questions just asking about names of particular articles that you've um, quoted and stuff. Um, those will all be archived and uh, available to all the participants. So you'll receive an email um, with the link to that archive as soon as it's uh, prepared. So and that's, um, we're probably going to have to wrap up here, unfortunately. And Beth, thank you so much uh, for your you. time and, and your great uh, presentation on this today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending um, Pearson's uh, Speaking About Composition conference this year. And we look forward to uh, seeing you, hearing you, uh, visiting with you on uh, future conferences.